Father in heaven, we see our need to being kept near the cross like never before. And Lord, as we start today, as we look into your word, we ask again, Lord, for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. You have promised us, Lord, this agency of the Godhead to lead us into all truth and to show us things to come. And so, Lord, this morning we ask, Lord, that I will fulfill that promise. Take away, Lord, any dullness of our minds and bless us, Lord, to comprehend with clarity of understanding, clarity of thought. And we will give you every bit of the honor, the glory, the praise, and the thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Time is moving so fast, saints. It is Thursday, and when you get to Thursday, it's just really over. So we're going to rush, I'm trying to take a lot of things and kind of compress them now so that we can get in as much as we possibly can. God has been very good to us. I've been, I mean, my eyes have been opened during these, these meetings, as I'm sure yours have been as well. We're going to cover a lot this, today, a lot this morning, a lot this all done today. We're going to be really, both of us, pressing in a lot of information. So we're going to get started just right, right, well right into it. From 1960 forward, saints, we have seen the demographics of America change. In 1962, we took prayer out of, out of the schools. Now, taking prayer out of the schools in 1962 wasn't an instant event. It, things had was began to take place way back in the 20s that caused prayer to be taken out of school in 1960, 1962. But if we look at this chart here and we read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we can see a litany of events taking place. First of all, the morals would begin to decrease as we lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's one of the things that had to happen. The morals would have to decrease. The Bible tells us that the morals would decrease. And what causes morals to decrease is when you take God out of the equation. And if we, go, if we had time to go through this and look at the history, we would see that morals took a nosedive starting in the 60s. It was the time of the, the baby boomers had come to uh, fruition, started in 1946. The baby boomers began to be born, and they lasted until 1964. And so... As the baby boomers entered the 60s, a new wave came into existence. The oldest baby boomer in 1960 was 14 years old. That was the oldest since how they began to be born in 1946. And so by the time that prayer was taken out of school, the oldest baby boomer was 16 years old. So these baby boomers the largest mass of human beings ever born at any one time moved through the 60s under this new culture that was beginning to come in. New demographics was beginning to come in. Calamities began to increase. Temporal prosperity began to decrease. The national deficit went up, which actually caused the temporal prosperity to decrease. All these things are combined. Now, all this is prophecy. I'm just going to put up this one slide for this. I'm, all I want is, this is something you can identify with a doubt of doubt. If any of you that was around at this time or even know about it knows that this actually happened. And this is what the Bible said, and that would be a result to all of this. The results to all of these things, morals declining, calamities increasing, national deficit increasing, temporal prosperity decreasing. Do you all know that when... Uh, uh, the peanut farmer, what's his name, Carter? When Jimmy Carter uh, left office, the national debt was at $985 billion. Wasn't even a trillion. And it had taken 204 years to get it to that point because we declared our independence in 1776. Up until 1913, 
we always paid off our debt every year. But with the emerging of the central banking system in America, that's another story, the debt went off the charts because we were able to print money without uh, gold to back it up. And so it, we just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so it was appalling in 1979 for the debt to be at $985 billion. So we, when Ronald Reagan came to office on the promise of balancing the budget. But when Ronald Reagan left, it, left office, the budget was at $3.2 trillion. So it had actually gone up. And the value of your money had gone down two-thirds. In other words, a dollar that was worth a dollar in 1980 when he came to office was only worth 33 cents when he left. Same dollar because we put that much money into, the, in, in, into a circulation. And, and it has continued to decrease since then. But that's not my purpose right now. All of this it will combine to bring on national chaos. We're there. What would be the, the solution to national chaos? What will it be, saints? A national son law. It will be a mandatory return to God in the form of a national son law. So what we see here is that the demographics of America have changed almost 180 degrees since 1960. Literally have changed. Back in the 1960s, if you were gay, it meant you were happy. Nothing else. It has a total different connotation today. If you did have some other persuasion, some other alternative lifestyle, you were in the closet and you stayed in the closet. But in 2013, we have the actual electorate saying we approve of gay marriage. We approve of marijuana. We approve of these divergent lifestyles. We approve of a lot of things that we never would think America, who, whom when it came up as two horns with two horns like a lamb, would ever do. But today, we are here. And this is all prophecy, saints. Now, my purpose is not to deal with this today, but it is to get your mind to understand that the demographics have changed. Now, in these changing demographics in the secular world, we were to have been a light in a dark place. Nothing changing. We were to be standing firm. We were to be a light pointing other people to the truth. We were to be those wise virgins. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? But because uh, just like what happened in the, secular, in the secular world, it also happened in our world. We made some decisions way back that caused us to actually become lockstep with the world. As the world was changing, we were changing also. That's the reason that Joe Cruz wrote the book. The first one he wrote was called what? Creeping Compromise. So it was a creeping compromise that was beginning to take place within the ranks of our church as well. Now, we were behind the rest of the churches in this creeping compromise. They had it, had it really... Uh, uh, taking it on earlier than us and it was coming out but then we began to catch up with them and the creeping compromise began to take place so in the 1980s Ella Cruz recognized what was going on and he began to write books to try to bring us back and you know he kind of opposition he met with he was even put out of his own ministry did you all know that this man was put out of his own ministry for writing those books so what I want to fixate in your mind now is that our demographics within this church has changed. And I'm going to get into, I won't be able to give you all the history because we just simply don't have the time. Between Brother Davis and I, I know we'll both of us will get some in. But the demographics of the church has changed drastically. And we're going to show you how those demographics have changed as we move on. Now I'm going to move from this. Satan is making war. Brother Davis talked about that crosshair yesterday, and here it is. I intend to give him a shot of it. The crosshairs. Now, this is a different idea here on the crosshairs. In this gun sight that you see, you see the truth. Somebody's aiming, aiming at the truth. Who's aiming at the truth? 
Satan is aiming at the truth. He wants to take it out by any means necessary. Satan intends to take out the truth. Let's see, what is this truth that he really wants to take out? What is it? The sanctuary cleanse. He don't, want, he don't mind you talking about the sanctuary as long as you don't talk about the sanctuary being cleansed and the investigative judgment. That he does not want you talking about. Oh, we, we, we're having a Sabbath school lesson talking about the sanctuary, but not the sanctuary cleanse, not the investigative judgment. And so you see Satan is slick. Oh, no, we believe in the sanctuary. See, the Sabbath school book is talking about the sanctuary. But what is it talking about the sanctuary? What is it telling you? Is it telling you that you go, must have victory over sin? Is the very same Sabbath school lesson that's talking to you about the sanctuary is also telling you that you can never have victory over sin. Now, I have clips of, of this various Sabbath school lessons in the past. As a matter of fact, one just recently telling you that the Bible is not teaching that you can have overcome sin. You can't overcome sin. But yet it still is talking about the sanctuary. What a dichotomy. So, brothers and sisters, Satan has zeroed in on the fact that the sanctuary being cleansed and the investigative judgment is the thing that he does not want discussed. Because that information will bruise and crush his head. And that's what we have been talking about here. Are you with me, saints? All right, let's continue. So he went to make war with what? The remnant of the sea which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he has to get rid of the writings of L.N.G. White, he has to make them a non effect because if you believe in those writings, then you have to believe in the investigative judgment and the sanctuary cleanse. So they have to, she has to go. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Look what she says now. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events. Look what it says. Let's read it. Opening to our what? Astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary, transpiring in heaven and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Now, look at the language she used. What does it does? What does she say? It opened to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, the reason she says it opened to our astonished eyes, let's go. We're going to study God's word today. Let's go to Daniel. Let's see if we can put in place the reason why she says that. In Daniel chapter 8, the Bible says, I'm going to start at verse 9 just so we can read into it. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. This is pagan Rome, starts off. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the hosts and other stars to the ground and stamped upon them. This is paper Rome. Verse 11, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. There's much debate about the daily and whether the sacrifice should be there, whether it is, it is a correct supplied word. We're not getting into that. That's not our purpose. The purpose is here is that the place of his sanctuary was what? The Bible says here plainly that the sanctuary was cast down. Now, we know no one can literally go to heaven and cast down the sanctuary, can it? We know that cannot happen. It said, but the place, the place of a sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And what did else did it do? It cast what? The truth where? And it practiced and prospered. So what, does the Bible, what is the Bible telling you here? It is telling you that this little horn power cast the sanctuary to the ground, and yea, it cast what? So where is the truth? In the sanctuary. So it cast the sanctuary to the ground, yea, it cast the truth to the ground, and what was it able to do once it did that? It was able to practice and prosper. Now, you go back in history, 394, the beast, the little horn, the Catholic Church set up the earthly uh, 
uh, what's this little wafer guard they do? They set this up back way back in 394. 394 had the people of that time coming in and actually eating this wafer as a means of having Christ in them. They, they said that is actually Christ. This is early as 394, brothers and sisters. So then the Bible says in verse 13, how long will this go on? How long will the sanctuary be cast to the ground? How long will the truth be trodden underfoot? How long? The question in verse 13, and then verse 14 says, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the answer is simply, when Christ leaves the holy and go into the most holy, then the sanctuary will be reestablished to its prominent and rightful place. That's what it's simply saying. Now, we don't have time to, to go into the nuts and bolts of that this morning, but that's what it's saying in a nutshell. So what we see here is that when the papacy came on the scene, it, by, uh, Satan through the papacy, cast the sanctuary and the truth to the ground. Why did he want to do that? Because he wanted nobody to have access to this information of the sanctuary. You with me, brothers and sisters? Because to understand what's going on in the sanctuary will be give you information to crush his head. So he wanted to make sure that was kept out of sight. And so the, 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 the doctrine and the truth of the sanctuary was out of sight during the Dark Ages. And Satan directed the people at that time to a false system his church, the Catholic Church. You understand, saints? All done this 1260 years. Now, the prophet says, <clears throat> all the people of that time thought that what was, what was the sanctuary? They thought that the earth was the sanctuary. That was the general understanding, that the earth was the sanctuary. But, L.G. White says, the passing of the time in 1844 opened to what? of astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary. So now Brother Davis went through this yesterday, was showing how Hiram Edison and the rest of them actually discovered that there was a sanctuary in heaven, that the earth was not the sanctuary. Remember, saints? All right, now watch. The dragon was making war. Now what does the Bible say? And the dragon went to make war with the remnant of the seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So once the sanctuary truth was reestablished, once we rediscovered the sanctuary truth, what does Satan had no other choice but to do what? Go and make war with those with whom was teaching and practicing this truth. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And that's the reason she says it opened to our astonished eyes because up until this time, they all thought that the that, that the earth was a sanctuary. It was common, that was the common belief among all the reformers, brothers and sisters. So he went to make war with the remnant of the sea. So this war started in 1844 and it's going to continue all the way until, until the end. This is the truth, brothers and sisters. This is, the, this is Genesis 3.15. Here are all, some, not all of them, some of the reformers. The Reformation, passing the baton. <clears throat> Great light was given to the reformers, but many of them received the history of error through misinterpretation of the scriptures. But remember, the reformers didn't know all of this stuff. God gave each one of them a little piece as they, as they moved through. Each one of them picked them another little piece of the puzzle. These errors came down through the centuries, but although they be hoary with age, yet they have not behind them a thus said the Lord. For the Lord has said, I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. In his great mercy, the Lord has permitted still greater light to shine in these last days. To us, he has sent his message, revealing his law and showing us what is true. So the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals have been given to seven-day Adventists to be given to the world. God gave us all the pieces of the puzzle that he gave them, plus he gave us the final piece. You understand this? So God has given us the complete thing. And so Satan's only alternative is he must shut us down. And now the prophet says that the church would indeed appear as about to fall. So we can see that it's going to look like he has succeeded. But he will not succeed, Satan. Because God has set up some schools of the prophet. And so each one of these pioneers passed the baton to the other and to the other and to the other. They all thought that the earth was the sanctuary. 
And they passed this baton to William Miller and to others of the Pioneer Adventists. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And so naturally, when William Miller began to study uh, and see until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, he thought that the earth was the sanctuary. And so when the Hiram Edisons and others discovered that there was a sanctuary in heaven, that the earth was not the sanctuary, that's the reason Ellen G. White says, it's open to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary. They were astonished to learn that this truth had been lost. And, but God has said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The answer, that's the, verse 14 is the answer to the question in verse 13. And so immediately, once we understood that, they went into the Bible and began to search and dig and understand these things and discovered the earthly sanctuary. So once they discovered the earthly sanctuary and discovered what took place in the earthly sanctuary, as we, you and I have been discovering, we have been discovering that same thing, have we not? We have been discovering what goes on in the earthly sanctuary. So when they discovered the earthly sanctuary and began to go through it and look at all the things that were taking place, they discovered the cleansing and recognized that in the earthly sanctuary that once a year the priest left the holy and went into the most holy to, to blot out all the sins, to, to, to get rid of the sins. And then they recognized what this meant then in Daniel, that Christ now, when he left here in 31 A.D., he went to the holy and now in 1844, he was going into the most holy to finish the work. Do we see it, brothers and sisters? All right, let's go. All, ever since 1844, brothers and sisters, every 15, 20 years, there's been men within our denomination that have rose up against the sanctuary service, the sanctuary. Here are a few of the names, Dudley Canwright, Abenon Ballinger, William W. Fletcher, Louis Aura, and I was intending my, my purpose was to go through all these, but we don't have the time, saying. Louis Aura Conrad, Harold E. Snyder, R.A. Greve, Dr. Desmond Ford, and Raymond F. Cockrell. We will talk about him a little bit because he's so recent. You, anybody know here, ever heard of Raymond Cockrell? Only one person, two people? Oh, saints, don't we need to study this man was instrumental in writing your commentaries. This is the man that wrote your commentaries. And I, when I looked at the history and looked at what all he did, and, and he finally decided that, you know, there we can't, we, can't, uh, uh, we can't prove that Christ went into the most holy place. There is, we can't prove there is a sanctuary. Matter of fact, he took his stand with Desmond Ford. I'm going to show you, I'm going to make sure I do this, show you why Raymond Cockrell arrived at this conclusion. We're going to show you exactly why. We're not only going to show you why he arrived at this conclusion, we're going to show you why all of our other theologians are arriving at the same conclusion. How, tell me, saints, how could a whole ministry that was raised up on one thing turn 180 degrees? How could that happen? What I'm, so remember what I'm saying? I showed you the demographics of America changed, right? From 1960 down to 2000, the demographics of America had changed. How long did it take you to change? 40 years. Put that down. Put that down. We're in 2013. Now you can see that you, it's out completely out of the closet now, right? So the, at the same time, the demographics of the church change. And so now we have, saints, the demographics of the church no longer believe this. Prominent leaders no longer believe this. They will laugh at you. They did a survey. They did a survey, and over 50% of the ministers that they surveyed no longer even believed in a heavenly sanctuary. And more... The, the, the rest of them did not even believe in a cleansing or investigative judgment. Now, they didn't believe in that. And they're your pastors. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I was in Tennessee at the very beginning. Don't be angry with your leaders. Don't be angry with your pastors. I'm going to show you why you should not be angry with them. I'm going to show you why. 
Then said the angel, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. For seven years after the Savior ended on his ministry, the gospel was to be preached especially to the Jews. For three and a half years by Christ himself and afterward by the apostles. Now, now I'm, I'm showing you now why we should not be angry with the leaders of this church, the pastors and what have you. When Jesus came, the Bible says that he came to give what? Recovering of sight to the blind. God's church was blind when Jesus came. He came to, to bring them back to where they needed to be. And so the, for this seven-year ministry from 27 A.D. when he was baptized down to 34 A.D., the gospel was to be preached especially to who? To the Jews. We read in Matthew 15, 24, that I am but come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Let me ask you a question. The prophecy that pinpointed when Jesus was to be, be baptized is what prophecy? Now, now, don't you go silent on me. Let me ask the question again. You know, now you, a lot of you here know. You just, sometimes you know when somebody asks you something like that, you get. So let me, let me slow down. The prophecy that pinpointed when Christ was to be baptized, that 2,300-day prophecy. I knew you knew it. The 2,300-day prophecy pinpoints when Jesus was to be baptized. The prophecy that pinpoints when Jesus was to be crucified is what prophecy? 2,300-day prophecy. The prophecy that pinpoints when probation will close on the Jewish nation is what prophecy? The prophecy that pinpoints when Christ will leave the holy and go into the most holy is what prophecy? The 2300-day prophecy. So the 2300-day prophecy also identifies the seven-day Adventist church as a movement that will come up to promulgate the moving of Christ from the holy to the most holy to do what? Finish the work. Now, do we, are, you following what, are you following my reasoning here? Everybody follow me? We're all on the same page? All right. So, so when, when probation closed on the Jews, then that prophecy, and remember now, what does, let's, go to, let's go to Daniel. Daniel 9. We're in Daniel 9, because Daniel 9, when you, after Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 10, is all still talking about what's taking place over in Daniel 8. So we're in Daniel 9. Daniel 9, let's see what other things. It says here, verse 25, know there, what, no, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy cities to do what? What do they have to do? Finish the transgression to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seal up what vision? Huh? Huh? In other words, had the Jews accepted Jesus with their probation closed? It would not have closed. So they had to make an end of sin, bring in everlasting righteousness. But since they failed in 34 AD, now that same prophecy extends to you and I. We have a time frame in which we also have to do the same thing. Are you following me, brothers and sisters? Now, I'm telling you now, but I'm going to show you later on. That's an absolute fact that we have a time frame that what we must do the very same thing that the Jews had to do. Now, the Jews had a, a time limit in order to do this, right? And then if, when they failed to do it, where was the gospel going to go? To the Gentiles. Brothers and sisters, the same thing applies to us. We have a time frame in which it must be done, and then after that, the gospel goes to the... All right, let's watch it as we go. So how... 
The first three and a half years were to be by Jesus himself. Let's watch it. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, Daniel 9, 27. In the spring of A.D. 31, Christ, the true sacrifice, was offered on Calvary. Then the veil of the temple was rent in twain, showing that the sacredness and significance of the sacrificial service had departed. The time had come for the earthly sacrifice and oblation to cease. And so that veil that was rent in twain, separating the holy from the most holy, was rent in twain, signifying that the earthly sanctuary was to be, have no more significance. Christ was not going to take his blood into that earthly sanctuary. He was that Passover lamb, right? That Passover lamb had to go somewhere, right? That blood has to go somewhere. But it wasn't going to that earthly sanctuary. And so, brothers and sisters, we know from that that he had to take that blood. And so if we look at the earthly sanctuary, would he take that blood to the holy or to the most holy place? Come on, come on, talk to me now. Well, I heard somebody say most holy. Who is that place? Stand, who, who, you said most holy? Where did it go in the earth? Where did the sanctuary? Did, you didn't hear me. I'm, evidently, you didn't hear me. In the earth, where did the blood go? Under the veil where? In the holy or the most holy? In the holy saints. We must look at the, remember, sometime back I put up a picture. This is a picture of the plan of salvation. Where is that picture found? In the sanctuary. So Christ had to take his blood to heaven to the holy. Now the NIV would tell you take it, it was taken to the most holy. That's enough for me to throw the, burn the NIV. That's enough right there for me to burn the NIV because it tells me that the blood went to the most holy. Burn it! All right, now listen. The time had come for the earthly sacrifice and oblation of saints. We need to get this. What does the picture say? What does the pattern say? That the, when the blood when the sacrificial lamb was sacrificed, that blood went to the veil in the holy. All right, let's go. Because pastors and leaders today would tell you it went to the most holy. There is no earth. That, that's what they would tell you. So we must understand these things. Pilate then took his place on the judgment seat and again presented Jesus to the people, saying, Behold your king. Again, the mad cry was heard, a wave of him, crucify him. In a voice that was heard far and near, Pilate asked, Shall I crucify your king? But from profane, blasphemous lips went forth the words, We have no king but Caesar. Thus, by choosing a heathen ruler, the Jewish nation had withdrawn from the theocracy. Let's go to John. Um, I believe it's John. No, Matthew. It's, I think Matthew 27 would be a better one. Let me get there right quick, and I'll tell you the verse. All right, I'm in Matthew 27, and I'm at verses 26. No, let me, let's, go to, let's go to John. John's going to give me, I want, John gives it more, more vividly. Let me find it. John 19, da, 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 da. Eighteen. Well, I can't find it in John, right? So I'm going to have to use one in, 20, in, in Matthew 27. Let's go back to Matthew. <laughs> and you know the story. When the multitude, let me, first of all, let me tell you this. <clears throat> How many times did all the Jews have to come into Jerusalem? All right, can you tell me what, 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 what can you remember? Did you write it down? What, what, what times did it have to come in? Passover. Now, actually, it was days of unleavened bread. So it had to be there. So, okay, let's put it down. Make sure we get this now. Let's put it down. <clears throat> it was the days of unleavened bread. What, what day did the days of unleavened bread come on? 15th. Passover was on what? All right. But they had to be there for, they had to be there for the 15th. That was, the, by the time that Jesus came on the scene, this had become a three-day feast because the 14th was what? Passover. The 15th was Days of unleavened bread, 16th was offering the first fruits, right? So actually the Jews would make their way into town sometime a week before. There would be caravans of Jews coming into Jerusalem, just like we have our 
uh, uh, yeah, camp meeting, what have you. There'd be caravans of Jews coming into town. The roads would be filled coming into Jerusalem. It, was, it had become a festive occasion. But all the males had to be there for the 15th. They had to be there also for Pentecost, which was 50 days after the offering of the first fruits, which was the 16th. And they had to be there at the Feast of Ingathering. So we know that they had to be there, right? Now, so on the, on the night when, when, when Pilate was offering, brought Jesus out and says, Behold your king. And they said, A wave of him, crucify him. It says, The multitude says, Crucify him. My question to you is, who was this multitude that said crucify him? Uh, all right. So it was all the Jews, not just the local Jews in Jerusalem. It was all the Jews from everywhere that come into Jerusalem during this festive occasion. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? That's the point I want to make. But the Bible says that they, the leaders persuaded them to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Are you with me, saints? So the people were persuaded to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Now we want to find out why were they able to do that. Look what it says. They had rejected, they had rejected God as their king. Henceforth, they had no deliverer. They had no king but Caesar. To this, the priests and teachers had led the people. For this, with the fearful results that followed, they were responsible. Let's read this part together. A nation's sin and a nation's ruin were due to who? The religious leaders. What did, they, what did the people say? Give us Barabbas. Now let's read this part. The religious leaders, the guides, and instructors of the people. Who were the saints? The religious leaders. This is, now listen, this is the prophet writing this. Who was it? The religious leaders, the religious leaders, the guides and instructors of the people, the men who ought to have pointed the people to Jesus, saying as did John, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, followed the lead of the enemy of all good. Who, whose lead did they follow? The devil. All right? Now what did they do? They persuaded who? Don't, 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 don't get up. Don't miss that. Who did they persuade? The poor, ignorant people. What does ignorance mean? You just don't know. You just simply don't know. You're ignorant. To say you're ignorant of something just simply means you don't know. Now, we seem to think that ignorance has a bad connotation. You're ignorant, old, ignorant so-and-so. <laughs> but simply, ignorance that simply means I don't know. So they persuaded the poor, ignorant people who knew not the scriptures to do what? Which testify of Christ to reject the Son of God. That's the reason Jesus was saying he started at Moses and began to expound upon all the scriptures, things that were pointing to himself. The poor, ignorant people did not know that he was Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question, saints. Could they have known that he was Jesus? How could they have known he was Jesus? All right, but studying the Bible, that's good, but we got to get more definitive than that. I believe it's preaching the truth. Okay, yeah, but we got to get more. All right, where in the prophecy? Huh? That, listen, come on, brother. Come on, get, get the mic over here for this, brother. Get the mic over here for this, brother. Now, saints, we got to get this, brother. Sister, we have to get this. Lord, please, people that are watching my DVD, please get this. Put the camera on this man. What, why, how could, should they have known it? They should have been studying the 2300-day prophecy. All right, now, saints, he says they should have been studying the 2300-day prophecy. What is it about the 2300-day prophecy that would have proved in, that this was Jesus? Huh? His baptism, all right? Had, so what is it about his baptism that would have proved that he was Jesus? The time. The time. If they had been studying the 2300-day prophecy, would they have been looking for a Messiah to show up in 27 A.D.? 
were the, were, was it there? Was the information there for them to know? The information was there for them to know. So had they been studying the 2300 day problem, understood what you and I are studying right now, that 70 weeks are determined upon that people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins to bring an everlasting right. Had they been studying this, they would have known that we need to be looking for a Messiah in 27 AD. Now, had they known that, then they would have also known, they would have been able to go back from 27 AD that sometime back before that, he needed to be born. Did anybody recognize his birth? Come on, talk to me, brothers and sisters. Somebody recognized his birth. Come on, stop telling me somebody recognized his birth. The shepherds, okay, they were told, but somebody else recognized it. Who? The wise men, okay, but somebody else recognized it. Who? Who? Anna, all right, Anna recognized it. Who else? Simon, he recognized it. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking, brothers and sisters. When he, so somebody was aware. And Simon says, now I'm ready to die. So they recognized it. So somebody was in tune with what the Word of God says. Do we see this, brothers and sisters? Now, Ellen G. White tells in Great Controversy, page three, start on page 314, 315, 316. She says, they should have known just from the prophecies that the Messiah was being born. So here it is now, saints. Here it is now. If they could have known by the study of the Bible in the sanctuary when he was going to come the first time, then, saints, you and I can know by the study of the Bible and the truth revealed in the sanctuary when he's going to come the second time. Amen. That's the reading of prophecy. She says, we should be earnest students of prophecy. We should not rest until we become intelligent in regard to the subject of the sanctuary. Don't you see why Satan does not want us to understand this very important subject now? Do we see this, brothers and sisters? Lord have mercy. They persuaded the poor, ignorant people who knew not the scriptures which testify of Christ to reject the Son of God and led them to choose a robber and murderer. The chief priests and elders persuaded the people that they should ask for robbers. And so the leaders did not themselves know. And therefore the people didn't know. Jesus says, if the blind lead the blind, give, give, if the blind lead the blind, what's going to happen? They both will fall into the ditch. All right, got a question. I got a text. All right, got a text. St. John uh, chapter 1. Okay. 32 and 33. All right. Go ahead, read it. And John bear record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize <laughs> with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descend, and remain on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, as I go back and look at this, I see that God, 34. in his wisdom, had all those, John was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, but then John was killed. All the evidence was that the physical evidence, you know, in other words, you had to go to the word of God in order to get this thing. I see the same thing happening today. I see all the pioneers of this church passed off the scene. I'm seeing people that when I came to church in 1976, stalwarts of the truth passed off the scene. There's very few people left that saw the and understand this message today, brothers. There's very few left. And there, none of them are in any positions. None of them are in a position. I know, I know people that were Star Wars in this message, and they, are, they don't know what to do. Now, they're old now, 80 years old, 85, 90 years old, and they are so dis distraught at what's going on. But they have no voice. 
Nothing. I can start naming them. You will know them. They have no voice. Now listen to this thing, brothers and sisters. God chose others. Now, when Christ died on the cross, 31 AD, the first three and a half years of his ministry was designated to the leaders. Did y'all know that? The first three and a half years of his ministry was designated to reach the leaders. And the leaders rejected him. What did he say in 31 AD? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. You remember I told you, I hope I have time to talk about this abomination of desolation. Because when Jesus left in 31 AD, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. And, and now, there are groups that will say, well, see, in 31 AD, Jesus left the Jewish nation. He left the church. And, and so that was no longer God's church. And, and they was trying to use that to, to, to take us down the line and say, this is no longer God's church. That's a lie. This is still, was, was the Jewish nation still God's church when he left in 31 AD? Yes, it was. How long did that probation last? Another three and a half years, brothers and sisters. So when he left in 31 AD, he wasn't saying, I'm leaving the church. I'm starting another church. He says, your house is left unto you, Jesus. In other words, I've been trying to work with you to try to get you to do what's right. I can no longer work through you. You're going to see this right now. So in 31 AD, Jesus was simply saying, okay, I've tried for three and a half years to reach you. I've tried to get you to accept me. Your house is left unto you, Jesus. The first office of mercy must be made to the murders of the Savior. And there were in Jerusalem many who had secretly believed on Jesus and many who had been deceived by the priests and rulers to these also, the, the gospel was to be presented. They were to be called to repentance. The wonderful truth that through Christ alone could remission of sins be obtained was to be made plain. So in other words, the next three and a half years, the disciples were to try to reach those who had been leading out in the murder of Jesus. You follow this thing, saints? All right. Three and a half years. First 20... The first three and a half years is 27 AD to 31 AD. If the leaders in Israel had received Christ, he would have honored them as his messengers to carry the gospel to the world. To them first was given the opportunity to become heralds of the kingdom and grace of God. But Israel knew not the time of her visitations. The jealousy and distrust of the Jewish leaders had ripened into open hatred and the hearts of the people were turned away from Jesus. So the first three and a half years, Jesus designated to reach the leadership. And after that, he says, okay, your house is left unto you desolate. The leaders. Now, look what the prophet says. Now, I didn't write this. What does it say? The leaders in the Jewish nation had signally failed of fulfilling God's purpose for his chosen people. Chosen people. Those whom the Lord had made the depositors of truth had proved unfaithful to their trust. And God chose others to do his work. So he says, I can no longer work through the leaders. So he says, God chose others to do his work. In their blindness, these leaders now gave full sway to what they call righteous indignation against the ones who were setting aside their church doctrines. That was 31 AD to what? So from 31 AD to 34 AD, who did God choose to do his work? Come on, talk to me. Who? Come on, talk to me now. The disciples, sister. It was the disciples that God chose. Who was in the upper room studying and praying? Who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? What was that? Now, what, what was their purpose once they received that Holy Spirit? What did this, what, go, 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 in, go to Acts chapter 1. Let's look at verses uh, eight, I believe, eight and nine. Let's see, let's see, brothers and sisters. Yeah, verse eight and nine. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me where? In Jerusalem and 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 so what were the, the disciples to do once they received that power? They were to do what? Where? In Jerusalem. They were to first try to reach those people in Jerusalem and then and to where? And then, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Now let me ask you a question, things. Did they do that? All right, let's see. Let's go over to Acts chapter 2, 
Verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was, they were all with one accord in, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as, their, as the Spirit gave them utterances. Verse 5, verse 5 is key. Let's read verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Who are these people? Come on now, come on now. Come on, no, no. Uh, uh, uh. Let's look at verse 5. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. You're not getting away with that. Come on, brother says, Let's settle down here now. Let's, we must, we're not studying. We're guessing. We're not being. What's, what's, what brother David said? We must be what? No, no, first, first one, pious, intelligent, and students. You're not being any of these right now. You're failing completely. All right, now let's look at this thing now. What day is it? It's Pentecost. Let's read the verse again. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Who are these men? And I won't. Who are these men? All the Jews. Okay, all the Jews from where? Why are they there? Huh? Why? Not the days of unleavened bread now. All right, all right. So this is what? Pentecost. So how many times do they have to come in? So these are the same men that were there 50 days earlier that were persuaded to ask for Barabbas and crucify. What kind of men are they? They are devout men. So you mean devout men tied paying Seventh-day Adventists can be persuaded to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus? Is that what you're telling me here today? Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you understand what you just, what you just learned? That it was devout men. These were, not, these were not bad people that crucified Jesus. They were devout. But because they were ignorant of the Bible, of the truth, of the sanctuary truth, they were persuaded to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you see this? Have probation closed on the, on the churches this time? No. That is not closed on the churches this time. So now you can see, saints, why we shouldn't leave here and be angry at people that don't, don't understand this message. Can't you see it? These people are devout, tired paying seminary, putting their children in church school, going to Pathfinder, going through all the motions that the church has dictated that you do but have not a clue about what this message is about. Are you hearing me? Do you understand what you're learning here today? Don't have a clue. They are devout. And these are the people that you have to go reach. Do you understand these things? At a hand. I have a question real quick. Sister White said in Desire of Ages 820.3, uh, uh, she said the murders of our Savior. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned that um, these devout men who crucified the Lord 50 days earlier came back in and we're, but I'm a little confused with these devout men included leaders that Sister White said were murderers of the Savior. Mm -hmm. And we should try to not judge them, don't hold it against them. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because Peter even says the same thing. Look what Peter says here. Let's go over here and look what he says. Let's go over to Acts chapter 3. Let's start with verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel you at this? He just healed them, infinite men. Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power of holiness we had made this, this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Listen to what verse 14 says. Listen. But ye deny the Holy One and the just 
and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. In verse 15, and did what? And kill the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead. Where are we a witness? Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, have made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him have given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Verse 17, let's read together. Amen. Brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it as also your rulers. Not only did the people, the rulers themselves, ignorant. Why were they ignorant? Because they had bought into the lie of the devil. Do we see this thing, brothers and sisters? So you see why by the grace of God, we have got to go back and by the grace of God, try to reach these people with the message. Do we see these things? Do you understand this thing? This is going to take some love that you and I don't have. Because you know what I want to do? I want to pull it with my sword. Oh, generation of vipers. But we can't do that. Saints, we need to get on our face and pray, please, Lord, give me the spirit of Jesus. You see, truth without the spirit of Jesus is not true. Are you hearing me, saints? I need the spirit of Jesus. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? Did we get this thing? God chose others to do this. God has chosen you now to do this, do this work. Watch this. Look at the screen. I put up 1995. You see that? They would not admit even the possibility that they themselves did not rightly understand the word or that they had misinterpreted and misapplied the scriptures. They acted like men who had lost their reason. That's where we are today. What right have these teachers? Come on. What, what right have who? These teachers. They said some of them, what are they? Mere fishermen. To present ideas contrary to the doctrines that we have taught the people. You, saints, you need to understand what they were teaching the people. Being determined to suppress the teaching of these ideas, they imprisoned those who were presenting them. God chose others. I'm telling you, I'm using the date 1995. I hope I have time to explain that to you. And I want to make pinpoint 1995, but I'm saying around 1995, when we came to the point where we would take down the three angels and put up a flickering flame, that's when we did it. That about that time, God is saying, I must choose others to do the work. You understand what I'm saying here, brothers and sisters? In 1990, as in Indianapolis, uh, G.C., when the, when the General Conference session was in Indianapolis, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists sent to the Vatican and asked the Vatican to send a representative to Indianapolis to open up our G.C. session. Yes, we did. Oh, I have the paper. In 1990, and the general and, and the Vatican sent over the uh, Father Murray. I'm going to call him Father because that's what the paper call him. Father Murray, that's what they call him, to come and speak at our GC session, open it up to welcome us to the city, etc., etc., etc. Why didn't we send for the for the a Presbyterian to come over and do that? Our uh, Baptist. Uh, 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 so why did we have to send for a Catholic priest to do this for us? And so from 1990 to 1995, the, the flickering flame began to appear on all of our literature. Everywhere you look, you saw this. And we said, what is this all about? In 1995, we were being programmed to give up the three angels' messages. By 1995, the official logo came out. The flickering flame. 
One of us, Brother Davis, and one of us is going to show you that that flickering flame is in harmony with every other denomination. Every other denomination have that same flickering flame. So that's the reason I'm saying 1995, God chose others to do the work. Are you with me, brother and sister? Are you following, you following my reasoning here? Look here. Now Peter begins to preach. When, as, as, as Peter began to preach, the Bible says here in, in, in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter uh, 2, it starts talking about where all these people are from. And about verse 12 says in Acts chapter 2, verse 12, and they were amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean is this? Others mock and said, these men are full of new wine. These others was the leaders. L.G. White brings out. They were saying, oh, no, don't pay any attention to them. They just drunk. But Peter says, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunken. As you suppose, sin it is but the third hour of the day. He said, listen, it's only 9 o'clock. He says, the whiskey stores are not even open yet. When I came up, you know, the whiskey stores didn't open at 11 o'clock. They called them the state stores back then because only the state was allowed to sell liquor. So they didn't open at 11 o'clock. So Peter said, listen, they're not even open. They're not drunk. He says, but this is that which was spoken by Joel. He said, this is fulfilling prophecy. And so from verse 14, brothers and sisters, down to verse 36, 22 verses, 22 verses, Peter pulls out his sword and he preaches this message. And as he preaches this message in verse 36, the Bible says, as he's coming to a close, he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both what? Lord and Christ. He's showing these people that people the ones that you were led to crucify. That was the Messiah. And he says, and then he says, God has made him Lord. And when the people, the devout men heard this, what does the Bible say? Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, what were they? They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do. What shall we do? What does Peter tell them in verse 38? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see the message that you have to give, brother and sister? You've got to go back and reach the devout men and women. But how are you going to do this? You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you go back, and when you preach this message, brothers and sisters, when you teach this message, the people will exclaim, we didn't know that we've been crucifying Jesus. We didn't know. What shall we do? And what you going to tell them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Do we see this thing, brothers and sisters? Our people are languishing for the, for the message. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Do we see it, saints? We have a work to do, saints. We have a work to do. Let's go. Man, I got so much. P Listen to this. Peter urged home upon the convicted people the fact that they had rejected Christ because they had been deceived by priests and rulers. Come on. Look at this. And, come on, let's read this part together. And that if they continued to look to these men for counsel and waited for them to acknowledge Christ before they dared to do so, they would never accept him. What's the message you had to give? See, the people today are bound, just like the people were bound back then. We have been programmed. Oh, did you get authority to do that? Uh, at, at, did, you talk, did, you, did you check this out with the pastor? My son always tell me people want to have Bible studies, but they're afraid to have them in their home. They don't want to go, we got to have it in the church. We got to get permission from the church to have a Bible study? Come on, brothers and sisters. The people have been programmed that we can't do it unless we get uh, the, 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 the blessings of leaders to do it. It would be all right if you had godly leaders. 
but we don't have godly leaders anymore. Very few. And I'm not saying all of them are bad. Don't get me wrong. No, please, camera. I'm not saying all the leaders are bad. Because in, 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 in Acts, right here in Acts chapter 6, look what it says. Let's go over there right quick. We need to put this down. In Acts chapter 6, the Bible says, Acts chapter 6, verse 6, the Bible says, I know plenty of good leaders. The Bible says, whom they set before the gospel. And when they had prayed, they had laid their hands on them. And verse 7 says, and what happened? And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. But now you heard Brother David say this over and over and over again. Who had to lead out? Come on, come on, talk to me. Come on, say it loud. Come on, people had to start the Reformation. Why won't the leaders start? Let's go find out. Let's go to John. Go to John chapter 12. Why won't they do it? This is what it said. Verse 39. Therefore they could not believe because that I, we in verse chapter, John chapter 12, verses 39. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal, heal them. Look, look at verse 31. Are you there, saints? These things said he sighs when he saw his glory and spake of him. Verse 42, let's read together. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, all so many believed on him, but because of who? The Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They believed this was Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah, but they would not confess him lest they be put out of the synagogue. Read the next verse. That's something else there too. What does the next verse say? Love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They say, yes, this is the truth, but we, I cannot acknowledge this. I'll lose my job. I'll lose my paycheck. I won't be able to go to the golf tournament. You're not hearing me, brothers and sisters. But in Acts chapter 6, they said, way with a golf tournament, way with the paycheck, I'm following Jesus. I see the Spirit of God working with these people, and I want to be saved. Do you see it, saints? And brothers and sisters, you and I have a job to do. Are you ready to do the job? Are you ready, brothers and sisters? This clock, y'all are not praying for the clock. Well, that thing says 10, 23, 20, 10, 29. Saints, I'm not halfway there, but I'm going to have to stop. I haven't seen Melissa yet, though. Until I see her, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Listen here. These powerful men, though making a profession of godliness, were ambitious for what? Earthly riches and glory. They were not willing to come to Christ to receive light. Do we see this thing, saints? Brothers and sisters, the issue here is victory over sin. We have got to teach the people, and I think it ain't. Listen, I'm gonna, you know, it's going to be in my second part. It, it, listen, it's not way down at the second coming. It's not at the general close of probation for the world. Brothers and sisters, it's known. We must be prepared to receive the seal of God. Pass the test and receive the seal of God. And this thing is upon us. Don't you see the urgency, saints? Do we see it? Yeah. This is the message that has to be given. I'm going to tell you, Brother Davis, and I was talking just before we prayed together. I've never seen it so clear in my life. Never seen it this clear. It's perfectly clear in my mind now what the message is, what we must do. Saints, this is real. Oh, God, please, Lord, help us. Please, Lord, you, please help us to do this, Lord. We know you have 7,000 that have not bowed in need to be a Lord. Please help us to move forward in faith. In Jesus' name. Look at this thing. Look here. The scripture, which above all others, had been both the foundation and the citra pillow of the Advent faith, was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That was the what? The foundation and citra pillow. Was it just a sanctuary? 
It was the sanctuary cleansed. Remember that? Because there you'll get bamboozled. Oh, yeah, we believe in the sanctuary. Oh, yeah, I believe in the sanctuary. Do you believe in victory over sin? Do you believe there's an investigative judgment going on that the sanctuary must be cleansed? That's when you pin them up in a corner. Oh, no, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. That's the crux. You see, you'll get bamboozled. Oh, yeah, we, I, yeah the church believes in the sanctuary. How much, what, what, which way do you believe? Like Santa Claus? There's a message here, saints. Look what the prophet says. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven and having a side of relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, the first and second angels' message and the third, unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Once the pioneers saw this, the, the foundation and central pillar, when they saw that, then they began to study and they began to build the pillars of this faith, the pillars in which you and, that have been lost, brothers and sisters. They began to build these pillars. What were those pillars? She says, one of the landmarks under the message was the temple of God, seen by his truth-loving people in heaven, and the ark containing the law of God. The law of the Sabbath of the four commandments flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The nun immortality of the wicked is, old, is an old landmark. I, listen, let's read that part together. I, come on, I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. What does that tell you? That she didn't mention no 2520. No false doctrine surrounding no 2520. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? She says, I can call to mind nothing else. If the 2520 was so important, do you not think she would have put it in that? Like Brother David said earlier, we have friends that have been bamboozled by this foolishness. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? They began to build the pillars. Victory over sin. That was the first thing they came up with because they recognized that the sanctuary had to be cleansed. I, I know I'm going to ask the audience to give you, but I don't have time. My time is up. I saw Melissa there a while ago. It's the Sabbath. They came with the Sabbath. They saw this, all this from the sanctuary. State of the dead. Health message. Rations by faith in 1888 because God was leading them on. You saw Brother David the other day trying how God led them on. Step by step by step. And then there's some need that's to need to go up there. What else need to go up there? Spirit of prophecy, praise the Lord. We, Brother Davis, we have some students in here. <laughs> we have some students in here. Spirit of prophecy is an identifying mark. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? Is an identifying mark of this church. Shouldn't be, be baptized into this message if you don't believe this was a prophet. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? Look what the prophet says now. Those three Angels. We've been talking about those three angels. Haven't we? And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Now here's the key. I'm going to bring this to a close right here. I'm gonna, here's the key. The sanctuary is the heart of the message. Now tell me, what does a heart do? Talk to me. All right, what does it pump blood? Let me ask you a question. If you got a good stomach, a good lungs, good liver, good kidneys, in perfect order. But the heart stopped beating. What happened to them? They all die. The sanctuary is the heart that pumps blood to every one of those pillars. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? If you get rid of the sanctuary, you will destroy everything up there. You, you understand that thing? Let's put the heart up there. The scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and central pillar of the advent faith was the decoration. Unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. See that heart? Now what Satan wants to do is stop that heart from beating. Are you with me, saints? Now in the next session, 
I'm going to show you that that heart is on life support. And God has raised us up to bring it back to life. Are you with me, brother and sister? Now, you know if a heart stops beating too long, what happens? Everything dies. Are you with me, saying? Satan is determined to stop the heart. I'm going to show you what he has done in the fourth generation of seven day events. That's the reason I can stand here and tell you that fifth generation will never come on the scene. God cannot allow it to happen because of what we have done in the fourth generation. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let us pray. By the way, someone asked me about this book. We have just a few left because I didn't get to that point in the, in the session. But we have a few of the books left. The Sanctuary Series by M. L. Adrian. We'll be talking about that book in the next session. Father in heaven, we felt your presence, Lord, and we want to acknowledge it, that we felt your presence. And we thank you, Lord. You have made this thing so clear in our minds, strictly from the word of God, the spirit of prophecy. It's clear. And Lord, help us and bless us to move forward in faith. Lord, there is a work to be done, and you have made it very clear. And we thank you for it. Now be with us, Lord, as we take a short break. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>